Well, uh, I think you have a contender, John Mamarian, because our next speaker says the ultimate diagnostic tool is here, which is <laughs> cardiac MRI. <laughs> cardiac MRI. <laughs> This is our Dr. Faisal Nabi, who is a true multimodality imager. He's expert in all the imaging modalities from echo, nuke, CT, and MRI. And um, he's gonna talk to us about the ultimate imaging modality. Okay, so good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. I will be, in the next 15 minutes, I will do my best to match Dr. Mamarian's excitement and convince you that CMR is actually the way to go. Uh, so, you know, those of you I hope have had a chance or at least seen your cardiologists, you know, use this technique more and more. And, you know, I'm going to try, there's many, probably every aspect of cardiology now, you know, we can apply CMR to. Um, the, the ones that are bolded in red, I'm going to give you some, the most common applications of CMR. And we'll just spend, I'll do it in a case-based format so you kind of get a feel for this technique and how you can take it home, uh, hopefully today, and apply it to your practices. So first is viability. So this is a 63-year-old person with diabetes who presented to clinic with shortness of breath. He had a nuclear stress test which showed a fixed defect which would imply scar in the LAD territory and then went on to have an invasive coronary angiogram which showed a 90% lesion in the LAD. Um, well, before fixing this uh, lesion, this patient had, of course, a, um, an echo which suggested that the wall was, the apex of the heart was akinetic. And you can see here, these are the cardiac MRI images, and you can see that the basal and mid-short axes of the ventricle work very well, but as you look towards the apex, which is towards the right-hand side of the screen and the long axis views of the ventricle, you can see the apex is akinetic or not moving, and also the wall looks thin. So the question here, is it really worthwhile to you know, take the risks of a procedure to maybe revascularize territory that's already scarred or dead. And therefore, you know, does, you, know you, you can't make, you know, dead meat beat. So how can CMR help us? Well, we use it, to, one of the ways is looking at viability with a technique called late gadolinium enhancement. Late gadolinium enhancement involves the use of gadolinium agent, which is an extracellular agent, and it accumulates in regions of dead tissue or scar, and this of course occurs in acute myocardial infarction, it occur occurs in chronic myocardial infarctions. And these images, what you'll see is, this, this is the only technique where you can see living and dead tissue in the same image. So the dead tissue is the brightness, and bright intensity um, hyper enhancement that you see, the white, so we have a mnemonic, bright is dead. And that, this is what we use to help, help us determine whether it would be worthwhile to proceed with revascularization. And why is that? Well, it was based all on this very important study that's well known in the cardiology literature, which shows that basically if you have more than 50% of your wall that has hyper enhancement or that is scarred, such as this picture on the very far right, it's very, very low likelihood of recovery of function post revascularization. Whereas, more, let, if you have less than 50% of hyper enhancement, great uh, um, opportunities for um, recovery of function post revascularization. So, let me show you our patient here. Again, the CINE image is on top, just showing you the function and structure of the heart. And then the late gadolinium enhancement pictures at the bottom. I hope if you compare that to what you saw in the last slides, all you're seeing is a slight sliver of hyper enhancement or brightness in the delayed hyper enhancement images in the areas where the wall was thin and akinetic. And this would be considered less than 50% transmural scar. And this patient went on to have revascularization. And you can see here the ejection fraction, which was initially 30%, post-revascularization improved now to 50%. Not only did the EF improve, but if you take a close look at the uh, myocardial wall itself, you can see that the thickness of the wall has also improved. So that was all hibernating myocardium. The next application is something probably very common to you. 72-year-old female presents to your office with chest pain, has the typical risk factors of hypertension, diabetes. This lady has arthritis, not able to exercise. She's on good meds, her physical exam is completely normal, her labs look fine, EKG shows the usual either normal or nonspecific changes, or in this particular case, some LVH, and a chest x-ray, which was normal. Now, probably, you know, um, I think Dr. Quinones preceded me, 
And you know now you have a variety of different options of stress testing that you can use. There's SPECT, there's dubutamine stress echo, and Dr. Mamarian very eloquently went over his cardiac CT. But my job is to convince you, or at least plug in your mind, that there's another option too, stress CMR. And so let's, let's um, show you what it can do. Well, it's a fantastic technique to see the heart. It's very high spatial resolution. You can see here with what clarity we can see the muscle. You can see all the anatomy. You can look at ventricular function. You can look at all the valves. And if you look very carefully at these images, you'll notice that the basal inferior wall, um, which is right here, is my point working? Right here, it's not working, that there's a kinetic. And you can also see that over here when this image plays. And that would indicate that this person has already had some sort of injury to the heart muscle. But more importantly, when, you know, when we move on to the stress perfusion images, we do just like is done in other labs. We have stress images, and then we have rest images. And this is kind of what it looks like. You're basically watching the flow of contrast as it transverses the myocardium. Now, I know it's kind of complicated uh, what, what's going on in the screen, but what I, I, I froze the images for what I want you to be able to see is if you look closely at these images, which represent the basal all the way to the apex of the heart, you see this diffuse subendocardial rim of hypoperfusion. And that is what we call an ab, that, that is abnormal. That is, you know, very, very suggestive of triple vessel disease or poor, you know, a very high grade stenosis that is causing hypoperfusion of the subendocardium or ischemia. And in this case, it was actually all around the clock face of the ventricle, suggesting that this was triple vessel disease. This patient went on to the cath lab. Uh, this was confirmed by angiography. You can see very tight stenosis. Dr. Shah can interpret these for us uh, much better than I can, but he was diagnosed with triple vessel disease. So how does CMR, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, how, how good is this technique? Well, it's been studied in multiple trials. This is a meta-analysis of almost 166 articles, comparing it to nuclear techniques of PET and SPECT. And you can see here that the diagnostic accuracy is just as good as PET. And in fact, it has one advantage, which is very important. There's no radiation involved. So um, just a take-home point that this technique involves no radiation to your patients. Um, and what about long-term prognosis for your patients? Well, this has now also been studied in 19 studies, almost 11,000 patients. You can see here, if we tell you that the patient's stress test is normal, you could take it to the bank that they have a very low risk of cardiac events over the next preceding year, less than 1% risk. Whereas as your stress test becomes abnormal, you can see the risk markedly increases for the combined endpoints of cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. I'm sorry I'm talking a little fast. Uh, I, I know Dr. Zogby will come behind me if I, if I don't keep on time. Okay, now one other advantage of stress to CMR we have is don't forget we have late gadolinium enhancement. So if we go back and look at our late gadolinium enhancement, I know y'all are all experts now. You can see here this rim of hyper enhancement. Remember, bright is dead. So this is an infarct that this patient has suffered that he did not tell us about, or he didn't actually didn't even know he has had a known infarct. And why is it important to identify this? Well, it turns out that CMR is actually a fantastic technique to identify infarcts. Because of its very high spatial resolution, small infarcts can easily be missed by other techniques, where it can they be accurately identified because of the high contrast resolution we have between normal and abnormal myocardium. You can see compared to histology, the infarct looks exactly like what you would see would the, uh, the animal have been sacrificed. And so why is it important to identify these silent MIs? Well, this was a study in almost 1,000 patients of high-risk individuals where they had a CMR and they just followed them. You would be surprised. In this study, almost 20% of patients had an unrecognized MI by CMR. And as these patients were followed for outcomes, it turns out the risk of their risk was just as bad as someone who had recognized myocardial infarction. So this goes on to tell us that it's so important to identify these patients early and get them on the right medications to hopefully reduce their risk. Now, don't forget with CMR, we're also seeing other things that cause chest pain. You see the aorta, the pericardium, and the pulmonary trunk and rule out PED. 
Now, the next very helpful case is in valve assessment. This was a 42-year-old female um, smoker presented with increasing sh uh, shortness of breath. Uh, I know we not, may not all be experts here in these images, but you'll have to take my word for it. There is mitral regurgitation here, but it is such an eccentric jet that it's very hard for us to quantify. But the physician who was reading the echo realized the ventricle was dilated, and one of the causes for that could be severe mitral regurgitation. It said, hey, you know, I'm not sure based on the images I'm seeing. Let's get a confirmatory test. So this pay so CMR actually has tremendous value in valvular heart disease, as we're learning. It can identify all the things that can, uh, the echocardiographers can do. We can determine mechanism of what, why the leak is happening, how bad the severity is, what the consequences to the ventricle, which is very important in determining therapy. And then the added benefit in those who have secondary MR is looking at viability and contractile reserve. And so this patient went on to have a CMR. And here are the CMR images. You can see here the ventricle is very dilated. The ejection fraction is normal. And you can see this regurgitant jet here of the uh, mitral regurgitation with blood leaking back into the atrium over here. By the way, this is normal. There was no infarct in this uh, uh, patient on the LGE images. So how do we determine mechanism? Well, one of the beauties with CMR is I can create any slice plane that I want to see. So here I've made individual slice locations at each of the individual scallops, and I've identified the problem at the, at that this was a problem of the anterior leaflet, and specifically the A3 portion of the leaflet. There appeared to be malcoaptation. I can then determine what the consequence of that mitral regurgitation is, Can we advance the slide? Okay, um, we'll go back one. Okay, so then we can, we can find out the consequence. The way we do this is we trace the ventricle to determine volume from all the way at the base all the way to the apex at both end diastole and end systole. Once I have an end diastolic volume and I have an end systolic volume, this is our most accurate method to determine volumes. We can then uh, calculate an LV stroke volume, which is simply the difference. And if we divide that LV stroke volume by our end diastolic, we can determine an ejection fraction. That ejection fraction can also be performed for the right-hand side of the heart as well. And if we look at the results in this patient, look at this. This ventricle was 331 cc's. The normal for this patient's age and gender was 174 mils. So markedly enlarged ventricle, and the ejection fraction had already started dropping. So this patient was already suffering from mitral regurgitation. How do we calculate the severity? Well, one of the ways we do it is something called the indirect formula. Basically, if we know how much blood the ventricle is able to put out, which is our LV stroke volume, which is basically the difference between the end diastolic volume and then the end systolic volume, and I can calculate how much blood goes out through the aorta, I know the, dif the difference will be our mitral regurgitation. And so in this case, we did that math. Here's our LV stroke volume. We minus what went out through the aorta. The difference is our mitral regurgitation. And we got severe mitral regurgitation. This patient went on to the operating room. This has been uh, looked at extensively in the literature and has shown to be well validated and is now part of the guidelines. Um, how about cardiomyopathies? This is a patient with a low EF uh, and a restrictive filling pattern and a very thick ventricle. Well, it turns out CMR can be very helpful in cardiomyopathies. Why? It allows us to see the heart in 3D. We can accurately quantitate volumes. We can look at EFs. Uh, we can do flow quantification. But the newest things I want to tell you about, it can be very helpful in determining etiology and actually probing the intrinsic nature of the muscle and trying to determine different tissue characteristics. And this can help us determine prognosis. So uh, this patient. Can we advance the slide? OK, so how do we do this? How do we determine etiology? It turns out all these different cardiomyopathies have different scar patterns. So using LGE, I can very quickly figure out what's ischemic from non-ischemic. Ischemic scar tends to have subendocardial infarcts, whereas non-ischemic scar, depending on the pattern of the scarring, I can determine the etiology of the disease pattern. So here's our, um, and why is it important to know why, what etiology your patient has? 
Well, this was a nice natural history study of cardiomyopathies, and you can see the prognosis is not the same for all cardiomyopathies. In fact, those patients who have infiltrative cardiomyopathies have significantly poor survival. So here is our patient's uh, images. You can see a very thick ventricle, but its real value, again, is with the late gadolinium enhancement. And look at this, diffuse global subendocard, uh, global um, hyperenhancement of the ventricles, the atria, the valves. This is a very, very characteristic finding for an infiltrative disorder, specifically cardiac amyloid. This, was, went on, this patient went on to have a biopsy and was confirmed. Um, I think my movies require a lot of processing. <laughs> All right, we can also look at other causes of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Two things that are very important for y'all as internists, iron overload, we can accurately identify with a technique called T2 star, and for patients, you're looking for cardiac sarcoid. Final point I have is a patient. Another very common indication is, is patient, this is a patient who, a 63-year-old smoker, was having calf pain with exertion. This was, um, I'm sorry. I think the more I'm trying to hurry, the worse I'm making it. Yeah. All right, 63-year-old, basically, he was having calf pain with exertion. We performed um, ABIs and segmental pressures with confirmed PAD. This patient had quality of life was uh, affected. He was a good candidate for revascularization. The vascular surgeons went, wanted to know before they operate or perform the procedure, what are they dealing with? A great technique is to be able to see the actual anatomy. This was an MRA of the patient's entire vascular tree. You can see a significant, I mean, total occlusion of the right SFA and tight stenosis in the left SFA. This patient went on to have surgery. Um, this technique has been extensively validated against digital subtraction and geography in all femoral, in all vascular beds. It has a very, very high diagnostic accuracy for identifying stenosis greater than 20, 50%. One thing very important to you as internists, if you're looking for patients with secondary hypertension, great te technique to look for renal artery stenosis. I hope I've convinced you that this is the ultimate test. <laughs> Thank you.